What's up, guys? Welcome back to Tidal Gardens. A lot of you guys have been wondering what's been going on in this new building, wanted an update, weren't able to attend the barbecue that we just had this past weekend. So let's take a look around and see what's new. So we're upstairs right now. And the first thing that's new is this utility room here. There's an air conditioning unit in there. And I was really hoping that this entire room could be kind of closed off to quiet down the air conditioner, but lo and behold, it doesn't really do that because the, the thing that makes the most noise about the air conditioning unit is the way that it just exhausts the air down into the main space. That's all the noise. So the, the unit itself doesn't really make a whole lot of noise. So I'm gonna have to kind of come up with a new way to, to do that. Even though the primary objective of this entire room isn't quite working out as far as the noise control of the air conditioner is concerned, there's still plenty that's going to be going on in here. So for example, this wall that you're seeing, this, this blank wall, is gonna hold all the pumps and controls for the cooling system that's eventually gonna go in. If you don't know what the heck I'm talking about with the cooling system, we have a 10,000 gallon rainwater cistern outside and it basically stays 55 degrees year round. The idea is we're gonna be running heat exchange coils pretty much just like this and uh, running a set also to every single aquarium by heat transfer we'll be able to reduce the, the temperatures down to about 77 degrees in the summer, which is our target temperature. Also, just having some nice space to hold stuff like mops and, you know, just cleaning the implements and excess, you know, like toilet paper and paper towels and stuff like that. It's kind of nice to have a, an actual storeroom too. Next up is this railing. If you recall what it used to look like, it was just a bunch of two by fours. And to some degree, it still is a bunch of two by fours. But we've installed this, uh, this is cow fence. It's an agricultural product, which is kind of cool because it gives this whole place a very industrial look. And this property technically is an agricultural building. And to kind of incorporate an agricultural element that still makes it look very industrial. I was kind of all over it. And the stuff is really, really, really inexpensive compared to other types of railing materials. I don't know if you guys have like dug into how much railings cost, but it's insanity. To do something in just like cable would have been five times the price. To do something in glass would have been 50 times the price. So going with something that's agricultural, yet gives us the look that we're going for. You can't beat that. So the fact that there's this blue glow going on downstairs is probably not lost on anybody. So let's go take a look at that. So check it out. We actually have tanks and lights. During the barbecue, Felix was able to deliver the first four aquariums to us. He's uh, Felix from Reef Savvy, if you don't know who I'm talking about. and. These tanks pretty much arrived right as the event started at noon. Obviously, I wanted them here sooner. Didn't work out sooner-wise, but it did work out in the sense that we did get the tanks and we got plenty of help from the attendees of the barbecue. And now they're, they're basically in place. The night before, one of my uh, guests here, Matt from Jayo Nation, he just started working on all this lighting and pretty much didn't stop working on the lighting until about 3 a.m. I mean, I, I had long since gone to bed and he just stayed up here and just kept working and working and working. So I can show you some cool elements that I do like about how we've set up these lights. The first thing that's kind of neat is we've installed these power strips and mounted all of the power bricks for the lights just above them. There is just enough room to connect the bricks to the fixtures down below. The actual metal hanging braces there, the, the strings are basically invisible from a distance. So this entire assembly has this just floating in space look to it, which is, I think is very cool. Also cable management is kind of a big deal for me. The channels that uh, Ecotech provides 
that you, know, you hang all the lights onto. They're really, really easy to use. They have cable management built into that, that top part of the, of the rail. But then you, I have, I've got six lights here. That's quite a lot of cabling to then try to hide or manage. And we got these Velcro neoprene sleeves off of Amazon. Those guys have worked out really well. I'll put a link in the description as to what those are. Like, I think they're called like Koo Man or something. But they've done really well. And they're reversible, so you can go black or white. We tried it both ways. The black really stands out against all the background that you see, whereas the white kind of reflects a lot of the grays that, that you see from the walls and everything. So the white kind of camouflages itself a little bit better. So all of the ones that you see are, are white in color. Here is where things start to get a little bit goofy. We had installed these outlets in the ceiling specifically for the lighting. On a flip of a switch, all of these things could turn on and off, just as a general like fail-safe measure if we wanted to. So all of these, we, there's three on each side. Already you can see that the way, the way that the extension cords plug in should be reversed. That is an easy fix. Also, we just have uh, temporary little mounting clips here. That's also, again, temporary because we're going to be putting J-channel up there to, to hide all that. As far as like the, the plugs facing the wrong way, that can be rewired and flipped around. A much more annoying and severe problem is there's three of these things and they're supposed to all be on their own 20 amp circuit. They are not. So when I flip on these lights, what tends to happen is two separate banks of them blow the same breaker. Clearly, electrician screwed up. My Finnish carpenter, he's going to open these up, take a look. Hopefully, 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 this is just a matter of two sets of wires going to the same breaker in the box. A much more messed up situation is if these things were serially wired up. And in that case, I would have to get kind of creative with just different plug points and whatnot. And I would not be able to use that, that main on-off switch. I would have to then rely on the controllers for the radions. Okay, a quick comment about these stands. In the past, I talked about what a pain in the butt they were to assemble. And in, in some cases, it definitely was a, a big learning curve, a big pain in the butt. Now having had experience with these things, I absolutely love them. And especially, I love the fact that I went with these casters because rolling them in and out of this building, moving them in, has been completely invaluable. Like, I don't know what we would have done without the fact that these things could roll. Also, we've had to move the tanks on and off of these stands to, uh, to drill the holes for the, the closed loops. You kind of see the, the inch and a half closed loop plumbing that we've, uh, we've got going on. Because we need to, to drill through this layer of PVC and this layer of polycarbonate, which we can also talk about in just a second. Each tank is resting obviously on the stand itself. It's resting on this material here, this gray material. It's called type 1 PVC sheet. Generally speaking, most people go with marine grade plywood for this layer here. And I thought that it was mainly to provide support for this top layer, which is kind of like the, the squish layer, just in case there's any irregularities in the material itself or even the, the aquarium, or maybe there's a little, little bit of dust or debris. You don't want that to, to create a pressure point, so you kind of need the squish layer. For the squish layer, it's polycarbonate, but I thought that this uh, layer of type 1 PVC, it, which is like a, a dense, rigid layer, was mainly just to keep this guy here from bowing, but I have since learned that this is necessary to keep the tank itself from bowing and you absolutely need it as a structural layer. Because I was hoping just to go with the squish layer itself, just because this is, it's fairly strong, but it's not nearly as structural as anything like this. Also, as far as this polycarbonate goes, most people would go with a layer of like foam insulation, but the reason why I kind of didn't like that is because it tends to, to get chipped and flake and kind of just look gross after years and years of use, whereas polycarbonate 
pretty much won't. And there was a concern about the way that these channels are essentially hollow and with a huge amount of weight might collapse. That was one concern that, that Felix had, but there's like absolutely no way. You could put all of your weight, like 300 pounds even, like right on a corner here with your heel just digging in and it's not gonna budge anything. Like it, this stuff is incredibly, incredibly structurally sound. Having said that, for the bigger tanks, we decided to go with uh, a different polycarbonate closed cell foam compound. It's also like a charcoal gray. They call it four pound foam. I'm gonna go ahead and assume that's four pounds per square inch. Not entirely certain, but Felix was a lot more confident in that product versus this, because no one has ever used this for, for holding the tanks. I don't personally have any issue with it, but just, just in case for the, for the much bigger tanks, we decided just to go ahead and get that foam. Okay, so the tanks themselves, are 10 and a half feet long by three feet wide. These are the, we call them the small tanks. These are the frag systems uh, because they're only 15 inches tall. And they're kind of, you know, they're easy enough to work around in. And there's a, there is a main overflow section right back here. Now, because of like there was a miscommunication, this system came with the wrong type of overflow. There was originally just an ABS sheet here that has like the, the teeth. The, I think that those are called like the, the weir. So it had just a, a standard uh, ABS sheet with the teeth. I wanted those teeth to be removable. So for, for maintenance mainly, because like over time, eventually stuff gets growing on those. I mean, even corals start growing on those. And it's a real pain to, to then try to clean it in the tank. So I, had re I thought I had requested the removable ones because the show tanks, the really big guys, have the removable one, but these guys didn't. So just for scheduling and, and, uh, and timing reasons, uh, Felix suggested you can remove that yourself with just a razor blade. And it's true, you can. <laughs> it, it took me like just a couple of days to, uh, to get this stuff all pried off and then uh, just, just, just scraping down all of the silicone that was you know, connecting the ABS layer to this glass. I think I got it clean enough and definitely clean enough to then reattach the new weir with the removable teeth. So I am looking forward to getting that going. It's probably gonna be longer than I would like to get these tanks plumbed, but uh, Jeremy the plumber, we're looking at a timetable of hopefully two weeks before we can get him back out here. But once uh, he is done plumbing this stuff, we can start getting water into it. With that in mind, let's also take a look at the sump, which is probably all also news to you. Okie doke. So during the barbecue, this sump was all wrapped up still. We didn't want anybody to accidentally ding it because there was a lot, a lot of people over. Uh, people just assumed this was gonna be the show tank because it's really pretty large. It's eight feet long by four feet wide by 24 inches tall, which is roughly the, the same sort of dimensions as the show tank, except the show tanks are gonna be um, two and a half feet longer. They're gonna be 10 and a half by four by two. So you can kind of imagine if this was just lengthened, this is essentially what the show tank would be looking like. This is acrylic and ABS, whereas the show tanks themselves are, are gonna be all three quarter inch glass. But yeah, this is um, kind of a, a blank template of sorts, if you can just imagine that. Because just philosophically, when it comes to sumps and me, I don't like a ton of different tailor-made chambers for, for everything. I like the blankest, openest space possible, and I will figure out over time what the different areas really need to be. Now, you might think, well, that's a lack of foresight, but trust me, like 10 years from now, there's gonna be some really, really, really custom things I will need to do, and I want to have that ability to then customize it further. As far as the equipment goes, I don't really plan to have any equipment sitting inside of here. That's why I've, I've put this really thick three quarter inch bracing all the way around. And the idea is that I can put essentially uh, like trays 
to then hold like a protein skimmer and another tray to hold a calcium reactor all on top. And those trays are removable, they have drainage and everything like that, but it's essentially to keep everything out of the sump area. To get an idea of how stupidly large this sump is, you can kind of see, uh, like my feet are at the center point. I mean, you could comfortably fit four people in this. So check this out, you guys. This is a three inch Schedule 80 bulkhead. And these guys are what we're gonna be using to run central drainage from the tanks to the sump. So this stand is going to house the really big tank. You can get an idea of just the, the scale of it by the number of radions that we have above it. There's a total of a dozen radion pros that are gonna be lighting this tank. Now, I wish I could tell you guys exactly when I'll be expecting this, but I have no idea. I also have no idea exactly how we're gonna lift this tank off of the truck and onto this stand. Luckily, the stand does roll, thank goodness, but it's gonna be a lot of weight just to get it onto this. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is a type one PVC base and on top of it is going to be a uh, polycarbonate foam layer. So once the tank is here, it is gonna be every bit of this tall. Is it gonna be a maintenance nightmare? Probably, probably it's gonna involve me with a ladder a lot just to be able to get in and around this tank, but it is going to be a bit of a spectacle no matter what. Let's take a look at the other show tank. The other show tank is going to be a peninsula that is located in this big cutout area. Now, it was not originally meant to be a peninsula. It was gonna be going against that wall there. But once we started to kind of eyesight just how big those sumps were, uh, Eight feet by four feet takes up a lot of space, and once you start drawing that out, it's like there's some really tight areas that to, to walk past, like really, really narrow. And by turning this guy into a peninsula, we essentially solved all of our walk around space issues. And it's also kind of cool to have another show tank, um, again, 10 and a half feet by four feet by two feet tall that's different than the other one that has the back against the wall. Problem is, when I first ordered this tank, the back wall did not need to be ultra clear glass. And now that this entire face is gonna be a showcase face with all of the, the overflow stuff now being over here, uh, that was a bit of an upcharge suddenly to then have to scrap a 10 and a half uh, foot piece of glass and replace that with an ultra clear. So this guy is gonna cost me quite a little bit extra, but I think that it'll be a really cool system once it actually gets going. Another obstacle is there's nothing up here. It's in one of the cutouts of the building. We're gonna have to build some kind of slightly decorative, slightly utilitarian structure so that we can hang our lighting from it. At one time we were thinking maybe there's a way to hang it all the way straight from the ceiling. That's 20 something feet in the air. I don't really wanna deal with that like ever. So we're probably gonna be putting some sort of uh, type of, uh, of like a pergola system to just kind of like uh, suspend everything overhead, all the electronics and everything like that can be up and out of the way and, and have plenty of structural stability to then hold a dozen lights that this guy's gonna require. The last time that I did an update, I talked about this entire RO system generally. We finally have it up and running. We've been using it now for at least two months, I'm gonna guess, and it is absolutely ridiculously awesome. I can't put into words how much I love this entire water system. It's completely changed how we do any kind of maintenance at the greenhouse. For the people that are new and don't know what the heck I'm talking about, this whole system runs on rainwater. The roof of this building collects rain, gets stored in a 10,000 gallon cistern, gets brought in, chlorinated, dechlorinated, micron filtered, and then goes through the RO system. 
This RO system is a professional unit that's under extremely high pressure. So it at, runs at about 180 PSI. When you're running RO systems at that kind of pressure, it's not really phased by the dirtiness of the water. So let me explain. There's a recycle valve on this. So the wastewater line that normally just goes to discharge can get re essentially recycled back through this thing numerous times with no real hit on performance. And what we're able to do here is get two gallons of clean water for every one gallon of waste. And you compare that to a hobbyist system that gets four gallons of waste water for every one gallon of clean. So this is on the scale of 10 times more efficient than a typical RO system would be. So that brings us to the water containers that you see behind me. This is where all the magic really happens for the maintenance. RO system kicks out all of the, the pure RO stuff to this freshwater holding tank. It's a thousand gallons. And we have two different variable speed drive pumps. These two variable speed drive pumps deliver fresh and salt water on demand to every sump in this entire system. Meaning, when we have four completely separate systems in this building, we're already good to go. In the greenhouse, we have five separate systems, and every single sump has its own access to fresh and salt water on demand. So these are constantly keeping those lines under 50 PSI of pressure. So all you have to do is open the valve, you get water. Period, end of story. When we want to make up new salt water, we open up that valve right there, and this pump then sends water from this tank to this tank, and you see my lovely ladder here. We then have to like climb up there, we usually meaning only me, to then pour buckets of salt in there. Eventually we're gonna get a, a platform, uh, because this is extremely, extremely unsafe. We shouldn't be doing this, but we need to get a platform. Once we are mixing in this tank, there's a, a valve there to do a, like a closed loop cycle here using this, uh, this variable speed drive. It, it works okay-ish, but it's not ideal. That's why I got this guy, which is a boat oar, essentially. And this whole thing can like extend, and I can get out there and spend five minutes rowing my salt water. How, how ridiculous is that? <laughs> how completely ridiculous. But no, it works. Because the other option was to spend like $600 to get an actual uh, mixing pump for it. And no, I'll just get a little bit of exercise, row the salt. All right, guys, that basically covers uh, all the latest updates to this building. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave those in the comments below. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, all that fun stuff. I'll see you guys next time. Happy reefing.